symbol of excellence in sports entertainment. As cold as a razor blade, as tight as a tourniquet, like the skin on a dying man. I don't want a piece of the world. I want the whole world. I make my own roof because it's much easier that way. Trust me. What's up, everybody? It's Marcus D'Angelo, and we're back for another episode of The Snake Pit. But if you are watching right now on YouTube, that is not Jake the Snake Roberts over there. No. Today, today we are welcoming a very special guest. It's a living legend, Larry Zabisco. Larry, thank you for being here, man. Well, Marcus, thank you for the invitation. And I'm not the snake man, but I always, you know, I used to have pet snakes. I liked snakes. And when you're on the road wrestling, they were like the perfect pet. Because if you didn't play with them, they don't care. <laughs> and you only had to feed them like once a month, once every three weeks, because you were always gone, you know, and you could sit down. they just like hang out with you. <laughs> I was, I enjoyed snakes. The kids like snakes, not, you know, poisonous ones, the little boas. Now, uh, how long did you have snakes? I did not know this about you. Oh, just when I was growing up, I used to get garter snakes and lay there and watch Tarzan as a kid on TV and have a little garter snake on my chest. You know, they'd curl up because your body's warm and played with it. But you know, snake was an it was a, a cool little pet. In fact, I had one snake, the big boa, six foot long, and my mother-in-law at the time kept trying to bribe me to sell it because she thought it was going to eat the baby. I said, no, the snake's not going to eat the baby. <laughs> not if you keep it fed. Now, yeah. when you're saying, I had all of that. I like I got dogs. I had some cats. I had aquariums, birds. When I was a kid, you know. But I love animals. Now, when you were seeing Jake come out on WWE, WWF back in those days, TV with uh, his snake, and it was getting over big time. Did you start thinking like, geez, maybe I ought to start? No, I never. Home. You know, I never thought about that. And, and to be um, open with you. There was a whole era of the WWE stuff, you know, with Jake and The Taker and Stone Cold and Michaels and other guys. I didn't get to see. I didn't I didn't see 10, 12 years worth of the WWE stuff because I was always with the AWA or the NWA and then with WCW. So every night their stuff was going on. I was doing stuff. So you never, were on the road. Yeah, I never got to saw it, to see it. The one rumor I heard, Jake might have already told you this, but from what I hear, Jake would you know bring the snake in, take it out of the bag, put it somewhere, or put it on his neck, and hang on. And Andre the Giant was scared to death. Of snakes. <laughs> I heard one time Andre saw it and ran like through a door. Boom! Getting out of the little dressing room. I'm sure Jake would have told you, but I know if it had been Andre once or what, but Andre was scared to death of the snakes. Jake just told the story to me, actually. It was uh, a couple episodes ago where the snake bit Andre and broke yeah. off broke off two teeth into him, and Andre didn't realize it until he got back to the dressing room, and Rick Rude was like, hey, you got something sticking out of your arm, and here both of his fangs <laughs> were sticking out of Andre, which is oh, just man. wild. But, yeah. Um, you know, uh, Larry, while we're on the subject of Jake, you know, ordinarily, whenever I get a guest host to sub in for him, because he's on the road, he's busy with signings and AEW. Um, but normally, if I get somebody to fill in for him, I kind of try to ask about the history with or around Jake. Did you and Jake cross paths very often? You know what? We really didn't. Um, you know, I mean, back in them days, Jake, you know, with the snake, he was like a hated guy, bad guy. And I was the most hated man in the... Uh, in the business for a while. Look at boo on me. <laughs> well, I'll tell you more about that later. Yes. So the bad guys never really wrestled each other, but I was always in a different territory. You spent a lot of time in the WWE and stuff. So I never really knew Jake a lot. Okay. You know, I really I really didn't have a chance. We were always somewhere else. 
And that's kind of what I was thinking when I was looking back at some research about you for the episode. I was like, they really were not around each other that much. And if they no. were, I, I would guess it was probably like a handshake in a locker room and then you're off to your own business, yeah, right? It might have been in the NWA, but you know, when the territories were still territories for a little bit before the snake. But I really don't remember much about Jay because we were always someplace else, you know. Yeah, yeah. I know that you guys, I think you were in Georgia at the same time around 1983, but that's about it. Um, yeah, so couldn't, pretty couldn't be right. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, today we are not looking at 1983. We're looking back to 1997 and your match at Starcade against Eric Bischoff. But uh, before we get there, I wanted to uh, look a little ways back uh, even further to uh, sort of tell the full story here. So you joined the commentary team in 1993 and you're going to wrestle as a baby face in 94. But your primary gig between 93 and 96 is broadcasting. I want to know, how did you feel about making the move from active wrestler to commentary? You know, it's an interesting story. I'll try to make it brief. But I was wrestling and up and back, up and back. Uh, and, and, and as the territories were dying, getting ready to go. But for a while, me and Arne Anderson were a team, you know, the enforcers or whatever. And uh, I was like 41 at the time or so. So I've already been around 20 years and had a couple of knee surgeries. Not bad ones, but torn cartilage. And, you know, I mean, it's a brutal sport, not a long term <laughs> thing. <laughs> really? Me and Arn made a great team. Arn was great. And the people bought us, even when they were starting to read dirt sheets and stuff. When me and Arn walked out together, you could feel that old school heat and the people, oh, you know, so it was a great team, and but, but then you know, WCW wound up taking it over. And to make a long story short, they brought in Bill Watts to run it for a while, and he was a idiot. No one liked Bill, <laughs> and he was happy that no one liked him because he knew he was an a hole. Right. His idea of running the, the WCW now is everybody gets beat by Eric Watts. Oh Lord. And I. I I wanted to hold on to my reputation for the last 20 years. And, you know, I'm still the living legend. And Bill made a group. He started making this group, the Dangerous Alliance. And had me and Arn and Bobby Eaton, Rick Rude, and Stone Cold before he was Stone Cold. You know, good guys. And Paulie, I think, was with it there. But I didn't want to be part of a group. Because then you become the same as the group, and I wanted to stay a single, the living legend, and carry on for a while, you know, after the me and Bruno feud and stuff. And so I said to the TBS people, oh, my, my knee hurts. So I, so I went in and got a little knee scope again to remove some torn cartilage and was home for a, a month or two, you know, rehabbing. And I get a call one day. I and mean, I did this because I didn't want to be in the group. And I said, well, what the hell? I get the knee thing. So I took myself out of the group. I was home. And I get a call from one of the producers that says, hey, Larry, Jesse the Body Ventura just quit. Can you help us out and do a couple of color commentatings over some tape shows we have for the syndicated markets? And I went, well, hell yeah. You know, they're paying me to sit here. I felt guilty. And so, <laughs> and uh, I lived in Alpharetta, which was 30 minutes away from CNN Center, you know, where WCW was. So I went down one day, and I can't remember who I did it with. It was Shivani or Gordon Soley or Jay. I mean, but I did a couple of shows where I did the color commentating, which I had never done before. I was okay. always. I was always a good interview guy. I mean, I had the gift of gab. Yes. And I did it from looking at my perspective at wrestling like it was real and trying to make everything make sense and be real so the fans could get into it and enjoy it more. Well, I did two shows, and all of a sudden the door swings open, and the producer comes in and says, Larry, you're the best color guy we've ever heard. Do you want to do the color on you know, our shows? We'll give you this much a year or a contract as an employee, you know. What? <laughs> How much? I almost fell off the chair because this was the time when Ted Turner was giving money away like candy. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, and the WWE, I mean, the contracts got bigger, so no one would go back and forth. So for a handful of the boys, it, it was great. 
And I went, well, God, this is silly. So I wound up working like a day and a half a week, making more money than I did when I was wrestling with all the benefits and employee stuff. And I commentated for 10 years, but I never planned on it. It just happened. Incredible. I mean, who's going to turn that down? Uh, hell of a deal. No, I mean, plus I have like 42 and I'm thinking, well, and I'm watching the new era of guys and they were already starting to lose the psychology. I mean, the clotheslines were invented. Every Lex Luger match was three clotheslines in the torture rack. Right. If the nasty boys was in there with somebody, there'd be 20 clotheslines. We're just clotheslining everybody kind of started around there. I was sick of clotheslines in the mid nineties. And now today there's 20 clotheslines a match. <laughs> yeah. every match I, I can't take it. <laughs> So, I mean, you know, once you start in with color commentary, uh, is a piece of you itching to get back in the ring, or were you pretty settled in, like, feeling good about your new spot? You know, I kind of got settled into it. And like I said, the guys that were on top, they weren't really that great, but I was making more money. I wasn't getting hurt. I was in my early 40s and been lucky with injuries, no artificial parts, none of that stuff. And the only time I wanted to get back in the ring was when – Lord Stephen Regal showed up. And I'm sitting there now getting sick of clotheslines and horrible matches. And Regal came in, and Regal was great. I mean, he could stand there with that look and talk, and he, and people hated him. He got a good heat. And, I, and, he, and he was from England, from Wigan. I mean, he knew how to get in the ring and, and have a match. Yep. So I... I did something special where I programmed a little thing with me and Regal. A couple matches and won some belt from. But the first match went like 27 minutes on TBS. And it was funny because I went back to the dressing room after the match and Brian Pillman was running around the back and all the boys were like amazed. And Pillman was yelling, they wrestled 27 minutes and there wasn't one clothesline. <laughs> You know, so I was trying to show the guys, you know, how to have a match without a clothesline. So that's why I did a little thing with Regal. But then I went back to the broadcasting until I developed the NWO thing. So. Yep. And that was uh, 1994. You had the thing with Regal, according to the research I did. And also that year in 94, you worked with a young guy named Tara Rising, who went on to become Triple H. Yeah, Triple H had a couple matches when he was first starting. Yeah, Paul was there just starting. Some other guys, you know, were starting. Then he had a new era of guys coming in. And, and Paul was good. He was like a natural. Plus, he was a big guy. Looked good, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, did you see, like, superstar potential in him early on or not so much? Well, I really wasn't paying attention to that part of it right then, you know, because there was some other new guys and stuff. But, but he was one that, you know, when I think about it, you know, stuck out in my mind. Because I was always a big believer that the business is a big man business. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're 160 pounds and my wrists are bigger than your arms, like some of the guys on TV that look like they're 18, but I'm not saying any names. <laughs> why are they in the ring? I mean, you have people, you know, guys like Brock Lesnar. I was a Brock Lesnar fan from day one. But when Brock walks out, people go, oh, my God, holy cow, this guy's him. Wow. Yep. You know, it's easy to pretend and I mean, get into it and enjoy the show. He doesn't just look like a guy you'd see at like the mall. Like when you see Brock Lesnar, you're like, okay, that's somebody. Yeah, he's you don't a real wrestling. guy. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, so I know that early on you're going to help along Eric Bischoff and uh, bring him along as a commentator. What kind of potential did you see in Bischoff early on in the AWA days? Well, I really don't remember too much with Eric commentating in the AWA. He, he came in doing some sales job. He was selling products and stuff. And one day, our announcer, Larry Nelson, who did all the interviews for some years there, all the boys were there to do interviews. No Larry Nelson. Larry Nelson disappeared from the face of the earth. It turned out like he had four DUIs and got busted again and was going to go to jail, so he left Minnesota and disappeared. Wow. He left the stuff all behind in his apartment, and then the, he just dis disappeared. Years later, we found out he was down on the Florida Keys somewhere. 
But the funny bit was the looking around, they're going, God, we need someone to interview the wrestlers. Hey, uh, you know, Vern Gunn is it? Oh, hey, you, Eric, you do it. And Eric was like, huh? <laughs> you know, because you never did that Mike stuff before. Yeah. I was the very first guy Eric ever interviewed. How'd he do? Well, he did good, but I mean, it took him a couple because the first time when he started talking to me and asking me questions, the puzzled look on his face and the way he talked, I cracked up. I went, no, wait a minute. But <laughs> redo. You know, so it took him a little bit because they just threw it in his lap out of the blue. He didn't expect it coming. But then, you know, down the road when it came to WCW and stuff, Eric did a good job. I mean, he really did a great job of, especially in the New World Order, of getting himself over. He had a true heat at yes. a time when everybody was dirt cheating and not caring. But Eric had a true heat. Hulk Hogan, who switched, you know, and stabbed people in the back, he had a true heat. But then Eric wound up doing a hell of a job. And then he was running the company, and he did a good job with that because he was a guy that – knew what was good and knew what was stupid. And he'd listen to some guys. And if someone had a something good, Eric would go, oh, yeah, that's great. It's better than the idea I have. We'll do that. You know, so he, he was smart with, with, with the business stuff. Now, you mentioned it, you know, in uh, I think it's 1994 uh, or 93, <laughs> he's going to be thrust into an executive role. And then uh, he's actually going to become the senior vice president the next year. Like when you're seeing this, a guy that you helped to mentor and bring along and he does credit you with with helping him on commentary and stuff like when you're seeing it now, all of a sudden, like, oh, this guy went from being a guy who I'm training to all of a sudden, like, OK, he's my boss. Like, how are you feeling about that? Well, it felt good. I mean, I had a good position with the company, a good contract. Me and Eric got along good. And, but I really didn't have to deal with Eric a lot because I did the commentary. Like I said, I worked a day and a half a week. So Eric's working his butt off every day. I'm on the golf course mostly every day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then I'd come in and do the commentary or fly out once a week to wherever Nitro was and that – and it was funny because uh, I'm a private pilot. I flew little planes around the country for 20 years. I couldn't take sitting in a car for hours and hours after you. And I took air a couple times with me on some flights. And the next thing I knew, he had a private pilot's license. <laughs> and wanted to buy himself some Cessna. But uh, yeah, fun got me on. We, we got along good. And, and really, I didn't really see him a lot because, like I said, I was golfing most <laughs> <laughs> he was working. <laughs> so that's good. I mean, the dynamic of your relationship didn't change just because his job changed. Um, jumping ahead a little bit, Scott Hall is going to make his debut at WCW in May 1996. And rumor has it that you came up with the idea for him to come down through the crowd. Can you confirm that? Well, yeah. I um, <laughs> There was a big meeting going on. They were laying out some stuff. And then Eric looked around and said, has anybody got any comments? And I went, um, I do, and then everybody there, the Crockett's, you know, and they all, they all look at me like, ah. <laughs> and I said, look it, here's what I would do. And I laid it out, because instead of Scott doing some idea where he's just sitting at ringside half the show like a nobody, you know, I mean, if it's an invasion angle, have him invade. Have a match going on in the ring and have Scott walk right down and butt in and the two guys go, what the hell's he doing here? And make it make it look real. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the thing now, I mean, the, the fans enjoy it for what it is, but to make the fans love it more and get into it more, the wrestlers have to believe it's real, you know, when they get in the ring. I mean, if you're in a real fight with a big guy, you're not going to slap them in the chest, and knock your head off, you know. So do it like, what would you do with this guy if it was real? But so I suggested, you know, how Scott entered and started and then the other guy and how to build up some things. And then Eric, then it got so hot, Eric wanted to be in there. So we programmed stuff and I put together a thing for me and Eric that we had a match, you know, I saved Nitro from the New World Order you know, and all that. And then he was smart enough to listen to good ideas. Double J, Jeff Jarrett, here to tell you a little bit about the nonstop savings happening over here at SaveWithConrad.com. 
Are high credit card balances holding you down on the card? If you're looking to give a guitar shot to your credit card debt or give your home the push it deserves with some upgrades and remodeling, you need to go to SaveWithConrad.com. That's right, SaveWithConrad.com. Conrad and his team are routinely helping my world listeners save five, six, seven, even eight hundred dollars a month. Oh, did I mention you get to skip your next two house payments? Take a cue from the last outlaw, because if anybody knows how to get the bag, it's me. Strut on over to SaveWithConrad.com today and see how much money you can save for free. That's right, it's SaveWithConrad.com. NMLS number three two four one six equal housing lender. SaveWithConrad.com. He was, and yeah, it's uh, uh, that's the other kind of thing that we hear all the time about Eric was like, yeah, you know, a lot of people criticize him for maybe not having a great knowledge of the business, but he was, however, smart enough to like kind of uh, take people's opinions backstage, whether it be you or Hulk Hogan or Hall and Nash, like people would come to him with ideas and oh, yeah. You're, uh, yeah, he's he's willing to accept them. So it's uh, yeah. good that he recognized he didn't just know everything. Well, no, he knew it, but, you know, I mean, he got the idea over some years, but then he was smart enough. Someone had a good idea. Great. If it's stupid, forget it. <laughs> you know, I mean, now, was uh, uh, yourself and Scott, you had a relationship from your days in the AWA together. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. In fact, uh, I, Winnipeg, Canada, some years, I don't know when, eighty. Some guy said to me, oh, hey, you're wrestling a new guy, a brand new guy. His name's uh, Scott Hall or something. And I said, oh, really? Is this like a new guy? So I'm thinking, oh, God, here's some new guy that doesn't know what the hell he's doing. So, you know, I'll figure out something. Because in them days, we weren't even in the same dressing rooms. It was oh, okay. a different, different business. So I go out. And the guy goes, oh, there he is, this guy, Scott Hall. And I looked down at the hallway, and there he is, six foot six, six seven, you know, 280, 90, whatever he was, and young. I'm going, oh, my God, I can get killed. <laughs> so I had my, <laughs> a match with Scott, but it went really good, and he listened and, and kind of thanked me for showing him some stuff for years over that very first match we had in Canada. Yeah, and I know that he credits you and did, or did credit you for many, many years uh, for, you know, putting him over and making him look good early on. And I know that he never forgot it, which is apparently going to kind of play into uh, the storyline that the two of you are going to have here. Um, before we get there, though, Hogan, of course, is going to join Hall and Nash in the NWO. And the thing is just going to take off like a rocket, in part because nobody could have predicted the heel turn for Hogan. Uh, when you're sitting there and seeing this huge turn after, you know, Hogan spent years as the most mainstream baby face ever, uh, what are you thinking? Well, I listened to the crowd. And after it happened... I thought it was great because the people bought it. I mean, Hulk had a true heat. They they were mad at him for real, you know. So it worked out great. So I would, you know, good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how can you argue with this? These contracts coming, baby. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good. That's probably the way to look at it too. Is like, hey, the company's success is my success. It's just yeah, gonna mean, and, anyway. and the fans love it more. It's if it's a success, that means the fans are loving it. You know. they, they certainly did, and Hall and Nash and Hogan were just all over the product and super over, and it doesn't take long before Scott is going to start singling you out in promos, and uh, when the NWO takes over the commentary table, he'll give you a hard time, and it's, it's <laughs> it looks like we're building to something. Um, who had the idea to get you physically involved in wrestling again? You know what? It, it kind of happened unexpectedly. I was doing the commentating on the show, maybe just at the very beginning of the New World Order thing. And and the table was next to the ring side. It was, it was by, by the ring apron before they built the set. So I'm sitting there at the ring side, and Scott was in the ring, and he had a match with somebody and beat him, you know, was doing his thing. And then he came over, and I had no idea what he was going to do. He came over to the top rope, to the ropes, looking down at where the, I was sitting next to you know, Shivani or whoever. And when he looked at me, I went, that's it. I ripped off the headsets and I stood up. And when I stood up, the crowd blew the roof off the place. I mean, to the point where I didn't expect it. It was like, and me and Scott both looked at each other 
And we talked through our eyes and we said, basically, people want to see this. Mm-hmm. And the way I programmed stuff, because I knew people wanted to see that so bad, I programmed the me and Eric saving Nitro, the pay-per-view before I wrestled Scott, because I knew people wanted to see that so bad. Yes. I programmed it out. It's so awesome. It and... like I mean, I stood up the crowd and, and we just knew that they, they, they want to see this. The reaction you were getting is pretty awesome at this point. Um, and uh, that's actually part of the, the notes here is like anytime you'd stand up at the desk, like, you know, people would start chanting Larry, Larry. So, I mean, uh, when you find out that you are going to start getting physical again, are you doing any kind of like training or were you pretty much ready to just step right back in? You know, what? I, I was always working out. I mean, I was always going to the gym, you know, and, and I was always pretty st- strong, real athlete. Never did any Roy's. I mean, when I started at 21, I weighed 245 pounds or so. 250, I think, was my heaviest. But I benched 465 and a half pounds with a one-second pause. And, wow. And, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I, was a, you know, I was like a real guy. So... You were, and I know that Bruno was your mentor, and you were you were kind of built like Bruno. You guys both had uh, I very did his workout, physique. yeah, with the chest. That's why I could bench so much, and... His his work, I was pretty much heavyweight, low reps, and that put the bulk and size on. You know, the bodybuilders would do a lot of reps because that would bring out more styrations and, and right. that. a little more definition. Yeah. Now, uh, I know that you and Scott are buddies here, but rumor has it that there is a lot of animosity backstage during this time because in part of because of Hall and Nash being shit disturbers. Uh, they also had really big guaranteed contracts, which were apparently rubbing people the wrong way. Uh, did you ever <laughs> witness any of the drama happening behind the scenes with that? You know what? I never did. I mean, wow. I mean, here's how it worked. I mean, we would go there, me and Bobby Heenan, like the, doing the broadcasting. And me and Bobby, I mean, we never had meetings before the show. You know, everything we called was ad lib. And me and Bobby would hang out, take a walk out back and have a smoke while everybody else was doing their thing. So we never we never dealt with the office or the boys or the matches and stuff they were putting together. Me and Bobby were just having a good old time. We'd <laughs> sit down and ad lib over everything we'd see. And it was like a night off. In fact, I, you know, I did the first hour. Then when Bobby came out, I left the building and, and got out of there an hour before the show was over. Went to the casino if there was one, had some fun, you know. But so it was really a gravy job for 10 years. And I really didn't deal with much of anything except. You know, the New World Order stuff. But, um, yeah, it was a great life. <laughs> Man, pretty good gig. You're spending a lot of time golfing. You get to leave the building early. Like, that's a that's a pretty nice gig you had there. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I didn't have to deal with everybody else, you know, trying to get over stuff, you know. Right. So... Well, during one of the instances when the NWO is taking over the announce table, you have a great line toward Eric Bischoff telling him that uh, if he keeps making bad choices, he's going to be back mowing Vern Gagne's lawn, which always made me <laughs> laugh whenever I'd see the clip of it. Is that really something that Eric was doing in the AWA days? No, no, he wasn't. <laughs> no, he wasn't cutting Vern's grass. But he was like a sales, sales guy. I mean, I don't know if he was... So when merchandising was just kind of starting in the mid 80s, merchandising or time television. But, yeah, Eric was like a salesperson for like selling TV spots for commercials and stuff. Right. Yeah. Whatever he was doing. But yeah. Yeah, I didn't uh, (laughs) know. Well, when you're going back and forth uh, between you are going back and forth, rather, between uh, confrontations with Bischoff and Hall. So it's becoming really clear that you're going to be getting involved with with one or the other. And on the July 28th, 97 Nitro, you'll drag Bischoff to the ring and feed him to the giant for a choke slam, which gets a really huge reaction. Uh, What did you think of Bischoff getting involved in the NWO? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So he would come and he'd he'd come and bug you at like the the broadcast table and you'd uh, just kind of hook him and drag him in there and feed him to the giant. 
Um, I mean, Eric is an executive with the company now here, and he's like now he's kind of putting himself out there front and center. He's becoming one of the biggest heels in the company. I mean, at the time, did you feel that that was a conflict of interest or like a good thing? for well, Again, not really, because like you said, he was becoming one of the biggest bad guys and he had a true heat. So he was helping to make it over. So, you know, he did a great job at it. <laughs> <laughs> Hard to argue with the results. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I mean, and, and that's the thing is, you know, what will the fans buy the most? Because you want to you want to freak the fans out so they love it and have to watch next week and buy the pay-per-view, you know. It's funny because, you know, I'll see a lot of folks uh, criticize it, including some wrestlers from that era will criticize it and say, like, oh, geez, you know, he was he was taking TV time. He's the boss. And, you know, instead of me being on TV or one of my buddies being on TV, Eric Bischoff is on TV. But in reality, it's like, you know, he was one of the first heel authority figures in wrestling and it was working really well. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, there was other guy. But when Eric did it, it shocked the crowd. I mean, it was another more of the NWO shocking the crowd. But. Yeah, no, I mean, it wasn't like he was doing it for himself. He already had a hell of a job running the place. He didn't need to do it. Right. He could a chance of getting his neck broke <laughs> with a clothesline, <laughs> you know. But, no, he did a good job. Eric was a natural. Certainly one of my favorites as a kid. Even though he was a heel, it always stuck out to me just how smarmy he was. <laughs> uh, at Fall Brawl, you'll be on commentary for Hall and Savage versus DDP and Luger, and you'll run in after Hall knocks out two refs and act as a ref yourself, and you're going to screw over Hall and Savage with a fast count. Uh, DDP was really on the rise at this point uh, after starting late as a wrestler and taking a few years to really kind of find himself as a performer. Did you see the potential in Dallas as far back as AWA, or were you surprised to see him rise through the ranks like that? You know what? Uh, D Diamond was... And when he came in, when I first met him, he was kind of green, you know, in the AWA. Then, but, but, but he really worked hard when it came to learning the business. He really put a time into watching the guys get over and wondering how they got over. One time he asked me if I'd go out to dinner with him, and he'd take me out and buy me a big steak dinner if he could ask me some questions. So I actually went out, and he bought the dinner, and he asked me, he says, how did you get over so much? I mean, how do you, I mean, he really went out of his way and put a lot of time into learning, not just wrestling, but the psychology of how to get over with the crowd. So he put a lot of time and effort into it, you know. He did, and he had some stop and start kind of stuff. And you know, at uh, at one point, I've, I've heard Eric Bischoff say that he looked like a uh, lost and found came to life because he had like a, a cigar and a toothpick and sunglasses, and he had all these gimmicks. But then, you know, by this point, he's really catching fire in nine, in ninety seven. Um, you're going to act as a guest referee at Halloween Havoc for the match between Hall and Luger. It ends in DQ, and you'll catch six in a choke sleeper before Hall and Bischoff double-team you. And the segment ends with Bischoff uh, standing over you with his foot on your chest. Uh, when you find out that your return to the ring is going to be against Bischoff, a non-wrestler, are you good with it, or were you responsible for working well, with Well, I'm Bischoff? the one that put it together. Okay. <laughs> So, as an announcer, they're coming. I mean, to Eric wanted things. to get involved, so I'm the but I'm the one that put it together of how to, you know. So the people were coming to you about creative and saying, like, Larry, what would you like to do for your creative? Is that pretty much how it went? No, well, not really. Was, Eric would a couple times, you know, and and then when everything I was involved with, I, you know, created it done the right way and. Eric asked me a couple of things, a couple of times about some stuff and his stuff. And I tell him, you know, what I do and why. And so I, I, I did have you know, influence. The guys, you know, some of the guys, they listened to me because they knew I knew. And they knew, like Diamond said, how did you get over so much? <laughs> but I learned from the old school guys who had to know how to get over because in those days there was no contracts. If you didn't sell tickets, you didn't eat. It's that simple. You know, uh, speaking of the old days, uh, I've uh, some of the guys that are working on my podcast, so the guys who do research and my brother Dominic who helps produce, they've got some questions. So I'll ask one uh, from Dominic now. He asked, I'd be interested to know, uh, once Larry became a top heel, did he ever have a desire in his career to reach the babyface height of Bruno, or was he okay with the identity that he established? Well, you know what I mean? 
the identity I established that I loved and was kind of stuck with because it, it, it was so big at the time. Plus the things that were going on in the business where, you know, the contract started and, and the territories were dying. And a lot of the top guys, you know, like Heenan and Jesse and Mean Gene and someone else, maybe from the AWA and Steamboat and Piper and Macho, maybe someone else from the NWA were all went to, you know, the WWE, which became, had a jump on the other territories with knowing the business is changing. You know, it's going into a nationwide business now, not a territory. And then the other two, you know, Verns and the Crockett's caught on, but just a tad behind Vince. Vince was the one that saw it coming first. Now, uh, Eric has said before that, um, you know, you kind of saw the writing on the wall with AWA at about the same time as he did. Um, how how easy or difficult was it for you to get another gig with, with WCW? Well, it was easy because uh, the thing was, their top guys went to the WWE. So the AWA always needed somebody, then the NWA. So I'd go to the AWA and I'd wrestle Nick Bockwinkle for a few and slip Kurt Henning something. And then I'd come to the NWA and we were going to start a big feud with me and Dusty and Baby Dow with the secret envelopes. And that's a different story. Then I go back to the AWA and I'd, I'd wrestled certain, had the belt and wrestle Slaughter and Harley Race, and we'd bring guys in because they didn't have anybody left that was over. You know, so it worked out good for me because I always had a place to go because they needed you because most of the top guys were with, with Vince. Right. I you got know. you. That's okay. why I never was with the WWE because they already filled up with top guys, and I didn't want to go there and have them all beat me and – well, I still had top billing in the other territories in Japan and on cable, too, because we were on ESPN with AWA and then TBS with WCW. And then. Uh, your time with uh, the WWF, and I, it would it would have been the late 70s, uh, like good experience, bad experience? How did well, you feel about it? It, uh, it was a learning experience because I was new. I started like in 1973 straight, you know, straight out of college. And Bruno took me under his wing, and, you know, I learned. I started off, they teamed me up with Tony Gurria, who had a little experience. And and it kind of came to me naturally, but because Bruno trained me and got me in, I didn't realize the power of politics I had because everybody wanted Bruno to like him, so Bruno would put a good word in for him so they could have a job. Gotcha. So when I got to towns and matches and places – you know, guys like Chief J. Strongbow or God, some of these names I can't remember, but, you know, Arnold Scolens or Fanini's or other top guys would take me aside and they would tell me things and teach me things. So Bruno, you know, to please Bruno, because they knew I was like Bruno's guy, you know. So it all worked out good for me, you know, with being Bruno's guy and and everybody, you know, being nice to me. I was talking to Ted DiBiase about his time in the 70s with, he was there briefly in, uh, I think it was 79 into 80 with the WWWF. And uh, I had heard that around the same time, Roddy Piper was, he got brought in and was just horribly ribbed. Uh, and on his first night, I think they stuffed his bagpipes with toilet paper so they wouldn't play whenever he went out there. And he got, <laughs> he got, yeah, he got, I, I, and I believe it was Freddie Blassie did it. And he got like fired on the spot because he went out and he was like, oh, yeah, I can play the bagpipes. It's part of my gimmick. He goes out there in Madison Square Garden, tries to play his bagpipes and they won't play. Um, okay. And so I think he lost his job. So I was asking Ted about the same thing. Like, you know, uh, so they were really coming after Piper. Did they come after you? And Ted was like, not really. Uh, and then he was like, I think it's because of the respect that they had for my father. So in your instance, it was with Bruno. Like they had respect for Bruno. They knew that you were Bruno's friend, right? Yeah. And you really didn't see guys that much. I mean, because, you know, like me and Gurria would travel together. I mean, someone else. And I start flying planes and take one guy with me or two. But you get to the dressing room, and again, we had separate dressing rooms, so a lot of guys you didn't even see. And then we got in our car and drove home. So 
you see the guys at night, but you really didn't get to hang out with a lot of guys. You know, it, different now, but in the old days it was different. So, you know, I didn't really have any weird experiences with anybody. I got along with everybody. And, and everyone was, again, was nice to me because I had a political connection. It's a good situation for you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right, we can get back to 97. Uh, you'll issue challenges to Hall over the next several weeks, but he'll say that you're not in his league. And in one segment, you'll be held by the NWO while Bischoff tees off on you with kicks and leaves you laying. A fan is actually going to jump the rail during the segment and try to get his hands on Bischoff before being dragged away. So, I mean, tons of heat. Um, you know, fans were were ready to get their hands on on Bischoff, and I'm sure dying to see you do it. Uh, it does make me wonder, though. Uh, like you're a pro's pro, you've been in the business for a while, and it sounds like you've got some creative control over this uh, this situation. But like any like Eric is whatever 180, maybe 200 pounds at this time. Any hesitation when it comes to Bischoff getting the better of you in in all the buildup? No, because like you said, some guys were holding me. He kicked me. You know, and Eric was in pretty good shape. He was into martial arts quite a bit mm -hmm. before that. Yeah, but, you know, but, but the way we worked it, it worked out good. And there was, we were just so thrilled. Everything was so hot and went so good and easy. You know, but there was no animosity. And it, again, I, okay, see you next week for a day. I'm off to the golf course. I mean, so, <laughs> it could know, be in a bad mood. My, once I had my stuff going and the New World Order started right off, you know, I, Live the life of Riley for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Two can be in a bad mood when they get to golf that often. Sounds awesome. Uh, the match is set for Starcade, and the stakes are that Nitro is on the line, where if Bischoff wins, he'll be in charge of Nitro. If you win, you finally get your match with Scott Hall. It's sold out in January 98. Uh, Larry, uh, Scott is a performer that was really highly regarded. He had great, great look, great mic skills, great ring work. Um, and this is something that comes up a lot. And Ad Free Show's researcher, Andrew Hermes, also was curious about you and your thoughts on this. Uh, do you feel like he's the best to never become a world champion? Who, Scott? Yes, sir. Um, well, I don't know. I mean, do, if you're over, you know, like Scott was, it doesn't matter if you're the world champion or not in terms of drawing money and being a value and, and Scott did a great job. I mean, he, God, it was such a sad thing. I mean, he has some problem, but he, he had the ability to come walking out with the toothpick and talk, made bad guy, you know, being cool. And, and he was really a talented guy. And yeah, I, could talk, I mean, yeah, it really breaks my heart, you know, to know he had a devil in him, but he was a really a talented guy, and it was like a night off being with him in the ring, doing stuff, you know. You stayed pretty close with him over the years, didn't you? Well, you really didn't stay close with anybody too much, but, and, you know, I live in Orlando, and he had a place not far down the road. So we'd see each other once in a while, and, for a while at the house here we were filming something in this corner or, uh, uh last call with scott hall i think he was last call with scott hall or something yeah. for a while when things were starting and i know nothing about computers or social medias or tweeting or instagramming or i know i have a flip phone marcus <laughs> sometimes i wish i only had a flip phone so yeah. i miss those days uh, we're almost to Starcade. Before we get there, I have to know your opinion of Bret Hart. He's going to leave the WWF for WCW after the infamous Montreal screw job. And Eric has said that Bret was kind of like a broken toy at this point, meaning that his heart just was no longer in, in wrestling after the drama in the WWF. Larry, are you familiar with the story of the Montreal I mean, screw job? You know what? I mean, again, I never got to see anything that happened in the WWE because I was always doing something with the other guys. And I never really got to see Bret Hart's career, you know, somewhere else. And I think I remember in them days something about hearing about something, but I'm really not positive what even happened in Montreal. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. I can I can give you like the Reader's Digest version of it, where in a, in a nutshell, he was having serious behind the scenes issues with Shawn Michaels. There was a lot of disrespect between the two of them. And uh, Brett even at one point came up to Sean and he was like, hey, look, let's bury the hatchet. He was like, I just want you to know I'm happy to put you over. 
Um, you know, anytime, any place, I have that respect for you. And Sean responded with something, Kurt, to the effect of like, I appreciate that, but I don't feel the same way about you. He said something to that effect. So now you fast forward and uh, Brett's about to leave the company. They're in Survivor Series in Montreal. And uh, Sean locks Brett in his own finisher, the sharpshooter. And Vince McMahon is at ringside and he calls for the bell. This was not a pre-planned thing. Just completely screwed him. Uh, that's how Sean got the no, bell. Well, Didn't talk to Brett about Vince it. did it. He might have felt seeing Bret Hart was leaving anyway, mm -hmm. that Bret might have done something Vince didn't want him to do. Like it would leave with the belt? Yeah, or, or not do what they talked about. So, you know, I mean, if, if Bret was leaving, then Vince probably just did that. Okay, over, bye. <laughs> you what? Know. What's your take on the whole like you know? Well, we're in we're in uh, Canada, so I don't want to put you over. Like, is it, like if you were in Pittsburgh, would you say like, hey, look, I'm not, I'm not, you know, <laughs> I'm not losing in Pittsburgh because I've heard about that with guys. Well, some guys might say that, but again, if they do. They really don't know the business. What you wanted to do was what's going to draw money. Yep. Or if I put you over, do I put you over because you're beating me up and I run out of the ring like a coward? So we can come back next month in a cage match where no one can leave or a lumberjack match. I mean, you know, to, to build something up. It all depends, you know, what made the most money. That was what was embedded in my head from the old school. It wasn't about ego. It was how do we make the most money because we won't eat. <laughs> 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 and and that's the right way to look at it. It's like, okay, what's going to draw? Like, who cares if I win or lose? What's going to draw a crowd? Yeah, it's a different business, you know, than normal business. It was just tough. And then, you know, then, then when the contracts came out and the big contract came out, it was, it was great. I wish it was still going. I can work a day a week. <laughs> just out of curiosity, did you have, like, I know that a lot of guys after WWE bought WCW, um, a lot of guys had contracts that were still had a, whatever, like two or three years on them. It was yours like that where you got to like, just go home and, or have yeah, my, mine and Bobby Heenan's wasn't like that. We were employees. I was, uh, and it was, it was kind of kept a secret that Turner sold out to TB. I mean, to time Warner, Turner, time, time Warner, whatever. AOL. Mm -hmm. And I just got a two week notice that said, Oh, in two weeks we're, not renewing anybody's contracts. So I went, pardon me, what? <laughs> you know, I mean, so I'm going from a big annual salary to nothing in two weeks. Is that what you're saying? And the same Brutal. thing happened to Bobby Heenan and, and probably a hundred other people. And then we found out, and then Eric wound up leaving and then they brought this idiot Vince Russo in and I, everything was going to hell. And then I find out, because I had a friend in the TBS office and stuff, that the reason they're doing this is because they're going to cancel the show. WCW was going to get canceled, and they knew it like close to a year before it finally got canceled. So they were not paying any more big money, salaries. They didn't care what happened. They had some writer in who didn't know a thing. No one cared because they knew they were canceling the show which was the hottest show on TV. I mean, it made no sense, but that's AOL time, you know. It made now, no sense. It was heartbreaking because we were, you know, after so much work and so over and so many people, you know, camera people, producers, you know, I mean, just, just got cut off. Now, uh, you brought him up, so I have to ask about Vince Russo. Uh, your relationship with him, thoughts on him, like what can you tell us about your experiences with Russo? Well, I really didn't have any experiences with Russo because shortly after he came in, my contract was not renewed. So, like, just uh, you're not necessarily having a lot of interaction with Russo, but just objectively looking at his work, you're like, boy, this guy's awful. Yeah, I wasn't even there. I mean, I watched some of his shows on television. But, and then for like almost 10 years or so, I really didn't watch any wrestling. I moved to Florida and I was golfing on the senior professional mini tours around throughout Florida all year. Wow. So I tried my hand at, you know, pro golf on the senior mini tours, did a couple of qualifiers for the PGA, but I was just like three stroke. I was a scratch golfer. 
72, 70, 73. My best game I turned in on the tour was 67. All right. That was my best game. Usually it was you know, 72, 70. You know, and to the pros that were out there, if they had a 67, they're mad. <laughs> they should have a 65 or 64, you know. But they were golfing for 30 years while I was wrestling. But I really didn't watch wrestling for almost 10 years or so. And that's why I missed the careers of like the Montreal screw job and a, a bunch of the stars of those days. And I missed all the Cena rock stuff. When did, uh, you, said, you said you were away from it for like 10 years. Uh, do you remember at what point you picked it back up and started watching again? I started watching it again. I think around 2012 when the WWE approached me and wanted me to get involved in some things involving uh, basically getting Bruno into the Hall of Fame because it was going to be at Madison Square Garden. It was perfect. I wanted Bruno to go there and the fan, you know, so, but I helped them out with that and got Bruno to go for it. And I got a great relationship with the company and the WWE is a great company. I mean, they take care of their athletes, get hurt. They take care of them. They're getting rehab. They're getting a the check, sitting home, healing up, you know, and they supply so many jobs, not just the wrestlers, production people, lighting people, truck people, you know, pyro people. Oh, it's huge. Oh, yeah, it's huge. And it's a, it's a great company. Triple H is a great guy who loves the business. So it's a, you know it's in good hands and and it's changed a lot. I mean the products change. You got an awesome production, you know the effects and the entrances and boom boom. But the, the matches there was a little more psychology. I'd like to see. I think it's time to have a new Brock Lesnar, a new Stone Cold. A new Hulk, a nuclear age Bruno. You know, it's time to make attractions, you know, because you see a lot of guys and you know, I'm doing the same thing every match, clothesline, slapping. Yep. I don't I don't picture Bruno doing a fucking off the top rope dive to the no, outside or anything. You wouldn't even think of that. Then you watch them, they run across, they run back, they jump over, and they got three guys standing there with their arms out waiting to catch you. Yep. Okay. <laughs> I mean, uh, the telegraphing how phony it is, right? Uh, I do have to ask, though, while we're talking about it, anybody modern day stand out to you as somebody who could be that guy, like the new, you know, Bruno or Rock or Hogan? You know, to be honest with you, I'd have to really think about it. I mean, there's some potentials. I know they're trying to give Cody Rhodes a, a push. Um, uh, NXT, I look at because that's really they got the most important job in the business to create you know new stars. Yep. I know uh, I hate the name Braun Breaker, but he looks good and he's Steiner's kid. I want to change his name to Breakenstein because everybody knows he's a Steiner. I couldn't believe it when they named him Braun Breaker. It's like, hey, this guy's got a great legacy name, and you know, his father, uncle, both in the business, and they're like, yeah, let's change his name. It's like, what? Yeah, Why? well, we've got a Braun Strowman, and what's Breaker? Is that a name? I don't. So I don't get it. But so they need to make some new guys. I'm not sure if they know exactly how to do it, and with the politics and all, because the, the performance center is six miles down the road from my house. I was going down helping out a couple of guys, but that was before the stupid COVID. Mm -hmm. And then it got so weird, but I really haven't been back yet. I'm keeping my eye open. They got some guys, new guys are training you haven't seen yet on TV. We'll see what happens, but they they really need to make a new era of attractions, you know. Is it like open door for a guy like you? Like if you just decide like, hey, I just want to go down to the performance center and see what's going on. Like, you know, they'd of course welcome you in and probably let you talk to the guys, right? Oh, yeah. I could talk to the guys, help out one of the guys with their groups, you know, or uh, take someone aside and give them like a personal tutor for, for their character. Because like I said, I mean, you got amazing athletes. They're amazing athletes, but they just all do the same. So for their character, I mean, if you're a good guy, you have to know you can't run across the ring into somebody's foot because you look like an idiot. Right. The bad guy outsmarted you, so he's not a bad guy. I mean, so there's a simple psychology that they need to know that's the hard part getting through them. 
When you would go down there and talk to the guys, did it seem like they were uh, like receptive to these well, ideas? Yeah, they're, they're all receptive. I mean, you know, but it's uh, it's just a different business. God, it's so different than <laughs> when I was in the ring. And again, I mean, you watch it. Uh, I'm, I'm amazed by the athletes. They're amazing. And they're doing dangerous stuff. I'm surprised more guys aren't hurt. And some of the women out there are amazing athletes. You know, but uh, I'm really surprised more of them aren't hurt because they're doing dangerous stuff. I mean, it's a hell of a production. It's a hell of an entertaining show to watch, you know, with the production and the action, one car wreck after another. But it's just to the point where, okay, everybody's getting in a car wreck. Well, who's the special car? Where's the, you know, Goldberg car, the Bruno car, or the, or the Stone Cold, you know, you need a to make some new era of top guys. Uh, well, let's get to the match. Eric is 41 at this time, and he's dealing with a fractured kneecap, which he suffered while working out in the ring with you. Do you remember Eric getting injured during the training? God, to be honest with you, not really. I mean, I he may that. have maybe one time because I'd meet him, him, DDP, and me would meet at the training building WCW had. At yeah. night and everybody was gone. Power plant, yes. Yeah, and and go over some things. I don't know if he might have hurt his knee there or not. I don't. Many brain cells. <laughs> As I'm asking, Marcos have gone. We're, we're looking back, whatever, 26 years. I can't remember what I did yesterday. Um, well, yeah, and I think that what Eric had said was that it was his fault. He said his leg was planted and you went for a leg dive and it just got him. Um, so, you know, is what it is. Pretty impressive that he was still able to go on with the performance, though, huh? Yeah, no, I mean, he was a good athlete. I mean, you know, Eric did a great job. He did a great job. Well, the match is fun, uh, and we've got the finish of it for our only clip this week. It's only a couple minutes. Let's jump in and see how this one finished up. All right, you've got Bischoff in the corner, and Hall jumps up, but you knock him down. Now Hart is trying to pull you off of Bischoff. Oh, boy. Hall's back up on the apron. And he is loading up Bischoff's boot with some kind of like a metal plate or something. Back up on his feet is Bischoff. There's the kick. And the plate, <laughs> and the plate comes flying out into the crowd. Hart's looking at it like, what the hell just happened? All right, Bischoff is kind of limping around on that bad knee. And celebrating like the match is over, but he's not pinning you. Hall's up on the apron now trying to do the 10 count because you're down and out. Hart knows that there's something fishy going on. Bischoff pleading his case, trying to get a two sweet from Brett and gets punched out. Oh, boy. Scott Hall's in there squaring up against Brett. Not working out great for Scott. <laughs> Hall selling the atomic drop. Just great stuff. And here we go. The first sharpshooter of Brett Hart's time in WCW on Scott Hall. Hall is tapping out. And you're making your way to your feet and you've got looks like a uh some kind of a belt or something in your hand you're wrapping the belt around bischoff's neck choking him out he's struggling hall is down and out and Yep, Bret Hart is raising your hand in victory. The crowd, wow. The crowd just leaps to their feet. Huge, huge reaction. How about that pop at the end? Wow. Well, no, I am saying it was over. It was. I didn't remember all that stuff that happened. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, I, I play clips in all my shows with Jake and Ted, and I also do one on ad-free shows with Jim Duggan, and I play a lot of clips to kind of, like, help jog memory and, and remind them. And so it's funny because every single time I do one, one yeah, of those guys I don't like, remember either. Yeah, they're like, I haven't seen that in 40 years. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you do it for so, yeah, so much. But that, that was cool, and the crowd went nuts. I mean, they were into it. And 
Yeah, I mean, look, it's, you know, are you going to get a five-star match out of Eric Bischoff and his fucked up kneecap? Probably not, but uh, it's like that crowd reaction spoke for itself. You guys told a great story. Oh, yeah, I blew the roof off the place, yeah. And then when Brett raised my hand, it blew him off again. Yeah, no, it was it was awesome. And uh, we saw it was funny, His the gimmick he put in his kick pad went flying and he had yeah, to sell it thing, in. <laughs> I remember that was something that went flying out of his shoes. No one knows if it hit me or not, but... Then... <laughs> Thank God it didn't hit me if I came flying out of there. No, it, it looked like it, it went shooting out before it made contact with Good. you. But you were a pro; you sold it anyways. Yeah. Um, well, look before I let you go. I think listeners would be pissed off if I didn't ask you this question. Wait, boo on me! Oh yes, that's right. Uh, so look before I do ask this last question, let's talk about that, Larry. Uh, you were telling me before we started recording that there's a special story behind that boo on me saying of yours, right? Well, there is. I mean, I got to people at pro wrestling tees uh, knew about this song. I made a song in 1980 called Boo On Me. Back after when, when that Bruno thing, everybody wanted to kill me. And uh, the reason I'm talking about Boo On Me is because I want to plug this movie that's coming out. And it's a great, well done movie. We filmed it. And it's coming out. They were thinking about maybe in October or so, but they didn't want to compete with the multi-million dollar advertising budgets of the Hollywood stuff. And it's coming out in January. And it's a movie called The Unbreakable Bunch. And it's about a group of wrestlers that save a town from aliens. And it's not a wrestling movie. It's not about wrestling but it's a science fiction action movie, very well done, family friendly, nothing dirty, gross, and there's something different. It's not Batman twenty or Chucky fifty, you know, stuff <laughs> and all that. And they, they, the one director heard the song I made, "Boo on Me," and wanted to use it at the end when the credits went up, you know, for the "Boo on Me" song. And there's some legalities, but one scene in the movie, I come out of an RV and I shoot some aliens and I go, boo on me, you parasites. And they <laughs> left it in. So one of the guys at Pro Wrestling Tees came up with this shirt that says, boo on me. <laughs> I'm going to say that to my wife. We'll, we'll see how she reacts. Boo yeah. on me next time she, whatever, wants oh, me to do the dishes. Me, I, I ain't going, hon. Boo on me. <laughs> I'll give it a shot. I'll probably get slapped either way. But you can uh, check out the uh, Google thing with the Unbreakable Bunch. It's got the trailers up. Should be out in January. Yep. So, guys, track the Unbreakable Bunch. It's got Larry. I know it's got Glacier. I think Ming is in it and a few Ming. other guys, right? Well, Ming's in it. I'm in it. Ernie the Cat Miller's in it. Uh, there was cameos with DDP, Stan Hansen. I've uh, got a couple other guys, some real actors that were from The Walking Dead and some shows. And I mean, it was it was it was really well done. I mean, I, I can't wait to see it. I can't wait to see it. <laughs> I, I can't wait to see it either. I'm going to Google it myself after we're done here and see where it's going to be streaming in January so I can check it out. But also, guys, Larry mentioned it. Go to ProWrestlingTees.com slash Larry Zabisco. So that's Larry Z-B-Y-S-Z-K-O. Oh. Um, and you can Yeah, they make these things now. I didn't even... Boo yes, me. they've got those shirts, and they've also got a, a selection of other shirts of Larry's over there. So get over there and check them out. They've this got some really a great cool shirt for all the protesters. It seems every day someone's protesting. Some I have a group of anybody can just boo on me. It's perfect. So if you're protesting, if you're going to a wrestling <laughs> event, you can wear it. Funeral, you can wear that shirt anywhere. Going to church, yeah. <laughs> sure. Why not? Now, look, uh, our listeners are going to be pissed off at me if I don't ask this question before I let you go. Uh, so this is the biggest event, maybe in WCW history because of the highly anticipated Hogan versus Sting main event. The idea for the match here was that the heel ref, Nick Patrick, is going to do a fast three count and award Hogan the victory before his sanctioned referee, Bret Hart, who we just saw, is going to come out and restart the match. And uh, then, you know, of course, Sting is going to win and send all the fans home happy. Well, what ends up happening here is that Patrick gives a normal three count instead of a fast three count. So Hogan gets like a legitimate win 
And when uh, Bret Hart comes out to restart it, the whole thing is just kind of screwed. Then, then um, it makes Bret look bad. Yeah, it made made Bret look bad. It made Sting look bad. So Sting winds up leaving with the belt, but all the crowd is like, "Well, he got beat. Like, what do we? That, that yeah. doesn't make any sense." Now, the rumor over the years was has been that Ho- it, this whole thing was planned by Hogan to keep himself strong while still dropping the belt to Sting. And your experience with Hogan, Larry, does that strike you as the kind of thing that he would do, or no? You know what? I, I didn't know Hogan very well at all. Again, he was always with the WWE. I was with other places. When he came in, yeah, I did my thing. But I really didn't know the Hulk good. But it doesn't seem like Hulk would care because he was over, had all that heat, and a, a fast count, boom, 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 would just mean he'd keep the heat, and then he could have a thing with Brett, you know, over that. So I, I don't know. It sounds like just something the referee messed up. I'm with you. You know, like, I think a lot of fans like to just pile on with Hogan and give him shit. But, like, if you think back the year prior, he he let Roddy Piper beat him clean at Starcade. So it's not like he's afraid Goldberg to let people just beat him. Yeah, yeah, he, he doesn't care. So I uh, just wanted to get your take on that because I knew fans were going to ask me about it. But, Larry, okay. thank you. Thank you so much for joining me uh, to replace Jake here while he's out busy on the road, as he always is. Uh, it was it was such a pleasure getting to talk to you and pick your brain, brother. Well, thank you. And I, I mean, I, I fly out once in a while. I don't like flying out too much anymore. Every couple of months to break the board. On my, I like going to conventions and signings because I like meeting the fans. I mean, it's fun to meet the fans, see some of the guys. But flying around nowadays, yeah. So I'm not flying anywhere till after the holidays. And then we'll see what happens. And if you don't like that, Boo on me. Boo on me. Get it. Get your shirt now at prowrestlingtees.com slash Larry Zabisco. And folks, we will see you next time right here on the Snake Pit. Thank you, Marcus.